It's an honor for me to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Levy is a board certified cardiologist and bar certified attorney. After practicing adult cardiology for over 15 years, he became aware of the enormous toxicity associated with much dental work, as well as the pronounceability of properly administered vitamin C to neutralize the toxicity. He's written 10 books several addressing the wide-ranging properties of vitamin C and neutralizing all toxins resolving from most infections, as well as the vital role in effective treatment of heart disease and cancer. Other books address the important roles of dental toxicity and nutrition in disease and health. He, he continues to research the impact of orthomolecular application of vitamin C and antioxidants in general on chronic degenerative diseases. His ongoing research involves documenting that all diseases are a different form of focal scurvy arising from increased oxidative stress and that they all benefit from protocols that optimize the antioxidant levels in the body. Please give a warm academy welcome to Dr. Levy. Testing, ah, it works. Is, uh, yeah, I'm coming through with, okay. Uh, first of all, let me say it's an enormous pleasure to be here and to make this presentation to this group. I have a disclaimer here I need to read. I do not have any financial interest of a product in my talk or with any company offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. Did everybody get that, or would you like me to repeat that? Uh, let's see if I make, okay, good, got it right. I wanna to talk today about what I think might be one of the most significant pieces of information that, uh, any dental practitioner, any physician can pick up at a conference. Namely, because heart disease is still our number one killer. And as I hope to demonstrate to you in the course of this presentation, there's not really a mystery as to what's going on and why it's taking place and what it takes to ameliorate it, stop it, and even reverse it. I'm going to actually be a little unusual here and start with my conclusion, repeat and reinforce my conclusion throughout the talk, and end with my conclusion. The conclusion is dental infections and the toxins associated with them spearheaded predominantly by the root canal treated tooth and to a lesser degree by periodontal disease is the direct cause, not correlation, the direct cause of 90% of heart attacks today, period. I mean, I think just about everybody has friends, family, parents, and even in this uh, audience this size themselves with diagnosed heart disease. Do not overlook this, or you're overlooking, in my opinion, and I'll show you the evidence, the single most important reason why a 55-year-old breadwinner for a family either drops over dead one day, even though he had no high blood pressure, even though he had no high cholesterol, even though he had none of the risk factors, he didn't just have bad luck. And this is what I hope to reinforce to you and we'll take it from there. It's unfortunately I'm limited to just an hour uh, because there's also a large amount of evidence that I'll spend less time on that the root canal treated tooth is the primary cause of a majority of breast cancer. Plain and simple, because of the draining lymphatics 
and the other information I'll present to you. Now, first I want to show that throughout the presentation I have numbers after articles and that number is the PubMed ID number. So uh, you can go directly to an abstract, sometimes the entire article. If you just type in that number on the PubMed box and hit enter, you'll go straight to the reference. <clears throat> now before I go headlong into some of the details on the research with root canals, dental infections, and toxins, I want to give you the what I consider to be vital backdrop of information as to why toxins are the problematic agent that they are in causing disease. I call this a unified theory because as of yet I've found no exceptions and I've been looking for quite a few years now. All diseases, all as in 100 percent, are caused by or their symptomatology is directly associated with or manifested by increased oxidative stress. Increased oxidative stress is simply when there's more agents taking away electrons than there are agents donating electrons. It's kind of ironic because there's a little more complex things in in science and in our world than in how an intact body or animal operates and functions and what defines good health and what defines bad health. There's uncountable number of things interacting at different levels. The complexity could not be greater. At the same token, there's also an overriding, even elegant simplicity to what causes all diseases. And I'm going to tell you right now, and if you find the exception, I welcome you to email me or get a hold of me. All diseases have at their core, intracellularly and in the affected tissue, increased oxidative stress. And the cure, if you will, is neutralizing that increased oxidative stress. Now that's where the difficulty arises. Uh, the cure is much easier to be stated than done. But that is what causes disease, and that is what ultimately is the characteristic or earmark of any effective therapy that causes a cessation or reversal of disease symptoms. Probably, as most of you know, I've written a little bit about vitamin C. Uh, and it's interesting because vitamin C is the premier water-soluble antioxidant in the body. The biochemistry of vitamin C actually gives us a very effective model in which to understand diseases. And I'll go into that. Okay. Now, the basics of redox chemistry is the basics of disease. A toxin, 100%, toxin is a prooxidant or it directly causes a prooxidant effect. In other words, a toxin directly takes electrons away from biomolecules or causes biomolecules to lose electrons by any of a number of mechanisms, 100%. An antioxidant, using the model of vitamin C, is the electron donator. So, a prooxidant and a toxin are one and the same. One and the same. And because of this, and this gives good body to a lot of the literature that's out there, but still little appreciated in mainstream medicine. Because of this, an antioxidant such as vitamin C is the ultimate antitoxin. There's nobody with any type of acute poisoning, if you can get to them quick enough, that if they don't completely re recover, 
with enough vitamin C being it, it administered, they will improve. The only toxins that are going to get ahead of you are a cyanide. You'll be, too, you'll be dead before you get a chance to take the vitamin C. Now, the relationship then of toxicity to infection. All pathogens, 100%, induce increased oxidative stress, and they do it by a number of mechanisms. They either metabolize or directly oxidize important biomolecules that are needed for optimal cellular function. Some of them directly produce exotoxins. Some of them, upon dying, if you will, become endotoxins. And some of them, think about this, some infections are subtle, but some infections are gross, and they actually are space occupying. And when you occupy space that other biomolecules need, you exert a toxic effect as well. So all of this together are probably the primary reasons why pathogens and infections with pathogens are uniformly pro-oxidant, a.k.a. toxic. Okay. Uh, I think they get a copy of the... Okay, you, you, you'll have the, the whole presentation with you. Some of these slides I'm going to smoke through, and some I'll pause on, so don't be upset if I don't spend too much time on a given slide. So, basics. Pro-oxidants or toxins. Pathogens are pro-oxidant or toxin providers. And antioxidants are nutrients. We hear the word nutrient thrown around. Well, I'm here to tell you a nutrient is nothing more than something that you ingest that ultimately metabolizes down to a molecule that has an antioxidant effect at the cellular and molecular level. That's what a nutrient is. So all antioxidants are nutrients. All nutrients are antioxidants. All right, now, with this backdrop of redox chemistry, reduction oxidation chemistry, <clears throat> let's look at a concept that's bandied about a great deal in the literature but I still think maybe is not completely understood. That is inflammation. Inflammation, and rightfully so, is now asserted, even in the mainstream medical literature, to be at the root of a great deal of disease. This is true. The only thing is they don't take it far enough. Inflammation, a.k.a., also known as, antioxidant or vitamin C depletion at the site of the inflammation. You can't have one without the other. They're actually synonyms. Inflammation means vitamin C deficiency where it is, and vitamin C deficiency means inflammation is going to take place. Okay? So inflammation is actually at the root of all chronic degenerative diseases at the cellular and at the tissue level. And as I have it phrased here, inflammation is really nothing more than a complex interacting array of pro-oxidants and antioxidants with a pro-oxidation predominance. One of the interesting things that occurs wherever you have inflammation in the body is we all pretty much know that when you have inflammation, this is, a signa this is a signal to the immune system, hey, come do something. Start the healing process, okay? Chronic inflammation causes disease, but acute inflammation heralds disease resolution because it mobilizes the immune system. Well, now, I just told you that inflammation is an antioxidant and vitamin C deficiency at the site of the inflammation. Guess what the first immune cells are that are heralded to an acute inflammatory site? Monocytes, macrophages. Guess what? Monocytes have 85-fold, 85 85-fold 85 
more vitamin C than the plasma. They are literally little pockets of intense vitamin C concentration. So the cells that are being mobilized to a site of inflammation where there's an enormous vitamin C deficiency are the cells in the body that have the greatest concentration of vitamin C. Pretty simple, pretty elegant. Fibroblasts also come in and they also bring in a lot of vitamin C. And as I just mentioned, acute inflammation is good to resolve and cure, but chronic inflammation, and this is where we're going to get into the heart disease, chronic inflammation becomes the disease. If you inflame and you can't resolve, you have a serious chronic condition. All tissues that are diseased have increased oxidative stress, so how is that going to give you a variety of clinical syndromes? Very simply, predominantly by these five factors. There may be more than this, but these were the ones that came to mind. First, you need to know how long has the increased oxidative stress been there, duration. You need to know the location. Is it predominantly extracellular? Is it predominantly intracellular, or is it both? How bad is it? Minimal, moderate, severe. And then, when you combine those factors together, and then finally, the chemical nature of the toxin itself. The chemical nature of the toxin itself doesn't so much make the toxin act any more toxic. It still is exerting its toxicity by taking away electrons but its chemical nature will determine where it gets absorbed, where it gets taken up, where it gets concentrated, whether or not it's amenable to being excreted. All of these are factors that figure into whether or not something is going to be a quick, short-term toxin, a long-standing toxin, or somewhere in between. So, just a number of these things to show you how a toxin, even though it's primary toxic, nature is to take electrons away, how it could have variable effects. You have the solubility product. Is it soluble in fat? Soluble in water? Is it amphipathetic? Soluble in both. Amphipathetic? I don't know. Then you have molecular size. I mean, something like vitamin C and glucose, they go all over the place. They're small molecules. You have a big, huge toxin, it's only going to go to limited areas. Then you have ionic charge. Neutral molecules are going to go a lot of places where ionic molecules won't. How well does it oxidize a biomolecule? Oxidation is not magic. Two molecules have to get together and they have to fit. So whether they fit correctly will determine whether one toxin or prooxidant molecule takes electrons away. Also because of this unique nature, some toxins will target certain enzymes that are present that prevent oxidation, antioxidant enzymes. That will have a more profound effect on oxidative stress than one that does it. Then accumulation. There's a physical accumulation factor in toxins. <clears throat> some toxins have a similarity to structural biomolecules and then they replace them and become inert. And then finally, how toxic a toxin is has to do with how quickly can it be excreted? How easily can it be chelated? Can it be sweated out of the body? Or does it need an exotic medical treatment to get it out? Okay, now, <clears throat> coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is a disease that begins with extracellular oxidative stress in and around the endothelial cells of the coronary artery. And it always begins, always, always begins with inflammation. Well, I just told you inflammation is a deficiency of vitamin C and antioxidants. So, 
why does the coronary artery in a susceptible person suddenly develop a vitamin C deficiency in the lining? Is that bad luck? Is it genetics? Might be a little genetics. But there's always something, if everything else in your body is fairly well balanced with antioxidants and you have none in the lining of your coronary arteries, there's a reason. Now, mainstream medicine, mainstream cardiology is actually in agreement about one point. Inflammation is now accepted as the primary cause for initiating and evolving atherosclerosis, coronary plaques. And furthermore, they actually consider atherosclerosis, as we we're talking about the differences between acute and chronic inflammation, they consider atherosclerosis to be a chronic inflammatory disease. Obviously, if you have inflammation present and it's not getting resolved and it's there day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, it's a chronic process and it becomes the disease itself. <laughs> I didn't think the slide was going to hit me. <laughs> uh, As Dr. Huggins said, in his inimitable, elegant fashion, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. What does that mean? Okay. If something is causing inflammation, or oh, let me back step. If you have inflammation, something is causing it. Inflammation just doesn't appear for any reason at all. Now, Pathogens associated with their associated toxins are now, interestingly enough, in, in mainstream cardiology, in mainstream medicine, they're actually accepted as a major reason for chronic inflammation. It's still kind of like nobody in mainstream medicine or cardiology wants to talk about the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Well, Periodontal disease, we've long known in the literature, is quote-unquote linked, associated with, correlated with the presence and evolution of atherosclerosis. And it's been recognized as an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease. So, okay. So this begs the question, If inflammation is always the cause of coronary artery disease, everything in biology is like layers of the onion. And you can always go another layer deeper. Well, nobody in mainstream medicine or cardiology has asked the question, what's the next layer of the onion deeper? Why is the inflammation there? I'm going to tell you. We've known for some time as well that there's a very strong connection between periodontal disease and biocardial infarction. And this is a great paragraph here to check for yourself some of this information on PubMed. The DNA of oral pathogens has been identified in the atherosclerotic plaque itself. And not only that, they've identified a diversity of greater than 50 different species that have been identified in atherosclerotic lesions when they take them out rotorooter style at atherectomy. Okay. Now the smoking gun. This study was done in 2013. I've actually had a little correspondence with the author, and I'm going to read it word for word. DNA of pathogens typical for periodontal infection and endonotic or root canal origin were present in the blood clots 
directly aspirated from patients with acute myocardial infarction. In 101 patients, nearly 80% of them, 80% of them had the DNA pathogen profile of the typical root canal treated tooth. And another 35% of them for periodontal disease. And if you want to put the nail in the coffin a little bit deeper, the concentration of the DNA in the blood clot that caused the heart attack was 16-fold higher than in the arterial blood. This is not correlation. This is cause and effect. Cause and effect. So, when a patient, family member, friend, anybody that you know has a heart attack or has chest pain, they need to have their mouth evaluated because most of the time it's going to be a root canal, but we now have very sophisticated equipment that you all are much more familiar with than I am. The 3D imaging, I can tell you that of the patients that don't have the root canal and don't have the overt gum disease, if you do a good 3D examination of all the teeth, you're going to find some pockets and some spaces and one or two of those teeth are going to have a chronic infection and they are your root canal equivalent. And they've got to come out if you want to give that patient a chance of not having a heart attack, but not proceeding to a heart attack and actually reverting. Even though it's in the book, and uh, anybody here at this conference can have a complimentary edition of the book that uh, Dr. Kulat and I wrote. Even though it's in the book, I want to tell this story. The, and I have his permission. I know all this stuff about uh, uh, confidentiality of patient records and all that stuff. The, my friend who owns a supplement company 10 years ago was having a horrible amount of chest pain and he had seven or eight different stents, stents placed over the course of a year and a half. Get a stent placed, worked fine, open up, more chest pain, another place is closing down. He was having what I call malignant atherosclerosis. It was fulminant. It was on a straight downward path toward, in my opinion, as a cardiologist, imminent death. He said, anything I could do, Tom? Well, I spent all my time with Huggins, and I knew what root canals can do, even though that was long before we wrote the book. And I said, well, you got any root canals? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, get over here, in this case, Denver. And I said, let's, let's get it taken care of. And he had chest pain all night, and he was depressed. And he said, let's not do with this. Um, I've had it, you know. He was really ready to pack it in. I said, BS, you're coming with me. We went to the dentist that I worked with, and he had one root canal, nothing else. Now, before I tell you what happened, let me also say that this individual was on a higher quality and quantity regimen of antioxidant supplementation of anybody I've ever seen in my life. He was taking liposome encapsulated vitamin C. He was taking regular vitamin C, grams and grams and grams. He was taking 50 to 55 different quality, quality nutrient supplements. And it wasn't denting his rapid evolution of atherosclerosis. Well, he got that root canal taken out. He got the socket cleaned out. This is 10 years ago. He hasn't had a chest pain since. And he's since had angiography that have shown a resolution of pre-existing coronary disease. Okay? This stuff is real. Do you have 95-year-old guys, gals, that have had a few root canals in their mouth for a couple decades? Yeah, sure. Do you know when you get your root canal and when you're age 50 that you're going to be the one that survives to 95? No way. 
Okay, so it's sort of retrograde reasoning. I mean, if you survived in 95, well, then you know that either the way your root canal was done or the way it was connected in the jawbone, it didn't have easy access to the lymphatics of the venous system. Who knows? Maybe you had a supercharged immune system, or as I like to think, you might be in the lucky percentage of people, and I do believe this exists. I, this is another story. I can't go into it now. That there are people like the wild animals that make their own vitamin C. And this is why you have grandpa that smokes a dozen cigars a day, does everything wrong, just cackling on his hundredth birthday. Okay. So, so as I said, <clears throat> this smoking gun evidence, I think, using straightforward logic, shows dental pathogens, primarily from the root canal treated tooth, as the cause of most heart attacks. Interestingly enough, to give further support to this, these same researchers actually looked at patients who had ruptured intracranial aneurysms. So you have off to the heart, you have up to the brain. Root canal related bacteria were found in nearly 60% of those aneurysms. So, okay. So now, I don't know how much I'm speaking to the choir here, maybe to some, maybe not to others, I'm not sure. But a root canal is the problem that it is because it's a fatally flawed procedure, okay? It's approached from the idea of mechanics. If we can get the tooth not to hurt anymore and still work mechanically, we've achieved a victory. Well, to that degree you have, all right? If the patient no longer has pain and the patient can now chew on that tooth when you're finished, that is a success by those parameters. But and this was documented by the work of Dr. Huggins and the good Dr. Boyd Haley, you, who you all know well. They examined over 5,000 consecutive extracted root canal treated teeth from around the country. And 100% of those teeth had incredibly potent toxins in them. And orthodontically extracted teeth had none, so it wasn't any contamination process of coming out of the mouth. And this was after multiple dilutions were done, because always the first soaking, if you will, had too many toxins to even measure. Why is this? It's because once you take out the nerve and the blood supply of the tooth, logically you're going to eliminate the pain a lot of times because you took out the nerve fibers. But you also took out the body's only immune system access to that tooth. Okay? The immune system is not magic. It needs a physical matrix to get where it needs to go. The macrophages, the monocytes, the lymphocytes, all of them, they just don't jump across the Grand Canyon. They got to go across fibers and nerves and tissues. And at the end of all root canal procedures, you already have bacteria seeded in the dentinal tubules, there's no way your immune system or an antibiotic or a laser is going to get to that. It never fails to amaze me how somebody applies a laser, not, on, not necessarily a tooth anywhere, but you put it in a tooth and the tooth glows, they think the tooth is sterilized. The laser only kills what's directly in its path. It's scattered light might light up the outside of the tooth, but it doesn't kill at a 90 degree angle. And <clears throat> I think it's pretty logical too that for most root canals, especially if they're in the molars, where do you generate some of the greatest pressures that are possible to generate? That's with chewing, okay? It's literally 
to be graphic. It's literally an endogenous form of having a syringe full of pathogens and toxins being forcibly expressed in the lymphatic system and the venous drainage every time you chew. Now, having said all of that, what can give you the variability in the toxicity of a root canal treated tooth? Well, they all have different pathological floras. Some have a dozen, some have two dozen, some have three or four, and all of those floras are going to act differently. So you have a different pathogen profile, you have a different toxin profile. The tooth involved, it would be logical that you're going to deal with much more clinical toxicity with a big molar or a, or a second or third molar being root canal than you would on an incisor. An incisor has very little, little physical volume of pulp and even when you chew, you're not really chewing with your incisors. You might, of course, nip off a little bit and you're doing all the main pressure generation in the big molars. So this will give you variability. The degree to which the bone supporting it becomes chronically infected as well. I think all of you know about cavitations. Cavitations for some reason, in some people, they stay put. In other people, they're serpiginous and they start migrating through the jawbone. Obviously, this has to do with immune system defenses, whether or not the person is already osteoporotic and has poor quality bone, all of these different factors. But the point being is, the quality of the bone is also going to determine how clinically toxic the root canal will be. Genetic deep predisposition, hugely important. <clears throat> and maybe in this genetic predisposition is the ability to make vitamin C out of your liver. Quality and quantity of, of supplementation, and how long has the root canal treated tooth been present? So all of these are factors where you can have one root canal that brings somebody down to their knees, like my friend I told you about, or you can have somebody else that has four or five root canal treated teeth and they seem to be doing fine, they don't have any evidence on routine lab testing of any problem, but I guarantee you, have the, uh, let, let the antenna go up if they have a chest pain before they have the heart attack. Don't, don't be slow to react. Now, Dr. Joseph Issels, this brings up another point. Uh, how am I doing on time? 20 minutes more? Okay. Dr. Joseph Issel is a phenomenal physician, uh, had a clinic in Germany in the 50s, and he had chronic cancer patients, metastatic, they'd been treated by the mainstream, I suppose, had their resources depleted as well as their bodies. And they eventually presented to Dr. Issel's 97% of these patients had root canals or other infected teeth. 97%. Okay, there's not much you can get 97% on anything. Now, one thing Issels did that fascinated me, and I think it saved my life, but that's another story. I think that's in the book, so you're not going to use up my time talking about that. Dr. Issels would also routinely take out the tonsils of these advanced cancer patients, routinely, even when they look fine. Virtually all of them were infected, even when they looked fine. Without going into the detail, this happened to me. I had chest pain. I remember Dr. Issel's work. I'd done everything that I could think to do. And in one of the Best decisions of my life that put me through more misery than I can tell you about, I decided to lie to an ENT and tell him I'm tired of getting tonsillitis, take these tonsils out. <laughs> and when it was all over, I said, well, what'd you find, Doc? He said, well, it's really interesting. 
I said, what's that? He said, well, I went to grab the left tonsil with the tongs. Even though he told me they looked normal, he said pus started coming out. My theory is that the tonsil is designed to deal with a minimal amount of intermittent oral infection, oral pathogen exposure, and protect you by that. But it's not a heavy weight, it's a light weight. When you hit the tonsil with a lot of toxins and a lot of pathogens, the protector becomes the infector. And this, in my case, was on the same side as the root canal that I had taken out 15 years earlier. Once they become chronically infected and abscessed, they do not resolve. And they bring you down. Having said that, one of the most miserable experiences an adult can do is get a tonsillectomy. It's saved by life, but I'm not sure I'd do it again, even if I knew it would save my life. It was miserable. Okay. Now I'm going to fly through these, these next uh, four slides because you can review them at your leisure. I just want to point out that malignancy develops when intracellular oxidative stress goes above a certain level. And that the worse the elevates, elevation of intracellular oxidative stress is, the more metastatic, the more anaplastic the cancer is. Okay? Now, most cancers are involved with increased extracellular initially, initially, extracellular oxidative stress. Okay? And in fact, in some cancers, this probably helps determine how rapidly a cancer cell is allowed to transform because you have a intercellular substance, a gel, that actually causes a physical, physical pressure, if you will, on the outside of the cell. And what happens when you lose your antioxidants, your vitamin C, you don't get the supporting proteoglycans anymore, and guess what? That gel becomes loose and ready. So you lose the physical restraint to growth. And this is at least one of the circumstances why cells become malignant. Now, <clears throat> I told you that we have smoking gun evidence that root canals cause the vast majority of heart attacks, period. Smoking gun evidence cause and effect. I don't have the smoking gun evidence on this. I will tell you my personal conviction is it's just as true, but I don't have the elegant study like I did for Dr. Pessy that she published in 2013. And that is the root canal is also the primary cause of breast cancer. Okay? Think about it. It shares lymphatics with the breast. The pathogens and toxins that are characteristic in a root canal, once the lymphatics too become chronically diseased, guess what? They don't just allow lymph flow in one direction. They allow lymph flow in both directions. So you basically, if you will, if you'll pardon the analogy, you have your breast tissue waiting in the same sewer of toxins that's present in the root canal. Okay. So, as a point to take away from that, just as I pointed out how important it is, family, friends, patients, think root canal and gum disease whenever you have a heart, a heart patient, and for any physicians here, and if I get the chance to talk to the physicians, I'll tell them the similar thing. 
If you have a patient with heart disease, you're not through until you evaluate their mouth. And now with the advent of the three-dimensional tools, get a full evaluation of each tooth for the subclinical infected tooth. Because I want to tell you, this is not a rare occurrence, it's a frequent occurrence. And it occurred with me as well, not that that makes it necessarily frequent or infrequent, but I'm going to tell you that when you have people with heart disease and they don't they have good looking gums and they don't have a root canal, really look hard with every tool that you have to look for the pocket, the area of infection on the tooth that's not giving them any problem because I guarantee you that's where you're going to end up. Or they had a root canal in the past and now the tonsils are trashed. So, back to the breast cancer for a moment. Let me just then read this paragraph to you. Any treatment plan in a patient with a brain tumor or breast cancer that does not include a proper extraction of root canals is missing the most consistent way to get both a tumor remission and a maintenance of that remission without relapse or the appearance of a new malignancy. The cause of a cancer, kind of like Dr. Huggins, can't dry off while you're still in the shower. The cause of a cancer must be eliminated along with the cancer itself in any complete tra treatment program protocol for cancer. They have a lot of things out there that are very effective in resolving cancers, giving you the apparent cure. Ozone, these are all great things. A lot of different things that the FDA is going nuts about, they're all very good. But guess what? Somebody goes into the quote-unquote cure or remission for two or three years and then something else pops up down the road. That's because they didn't look at why it started. They just had a very effective treatment therapy and they were able to stimulate immune system function well enough to get to hold it at bay, get a temporary resolution, but you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. All right. So, in case I haven't mentioned it, the single most important cause of cancer of the head, neck, and chest is the root canal treated tooth, and the single most important cause of atherosclerosis and heart attacks is the root canal treated tooth. And, I don't know, this might be a low number. Is 14 million a low number of root canals being done annually now? I don't know. Anybody got a figure on that? Low, okay. <laughs> All right. Now, you may ask the question, may not. How come the coronary artery is the artery that gets so selectively seeded by the root canal treated tooth? or the pathogen from the mouth. Think about it. You chew, you squeeze the pathogens and the toxins into either the lymphatics and or the venous blood. Okay, let's say it goes with the venous blood. Venous blood is low pressure. That's the biggie here. So it stays in a low pressure venous system down to the right atrium, right ventricle, into the pulmonary arteries, low pressure. Then, when it finally comes around, back down to the left atrium, and then it enters the left ventricle, and then whoosh, instantaneously, whatever is in that blood now has a pressure of 120 to 150 millimeters of mercury rather than three or four or five, six millimeters of mercury, five or six millimeters of mercury. You have a pressure that induces implantation into the arterial wall. That's why the coronary arteries get it first and most severely. And of course, I just mentioned the cerebrals. They get the high pressure too, which we saw in the ruptured intracranial aneurysms. Interestingly enough, if you want to know how important pressure is to atherosclerosis, I don't even know that most cardiologists know this, or if they do know it, they didn't realize it. But by that, I mean 
you don't develop coronary atherosclerosis in intramyocardial coronary arteries. The arteries that course through the muscle don't develop atherosclerosis, only the arteries that are on the outside, the epicardial. Why is that? The epicardial have to deal with the pressure. Okay, they don't, whereas when you're inside the myocardium and you're a blood vessel, you have the external support of the muscle, and so there's nothing that gets traumatized. So you need the stress of pressure to get this process rolling. Now, as well, there's a lot, always a lot of information that uh, there's radiological evidence of infection in the bone around the tips of the tooth roots, and you could look at that study. Now, talking about 3D, 3D has really changed the game. I, I'm sure all of you don't have it. I, I would encourage you, if it's financially feasible for your practice, to try to get the 3D uh, instrumentology because it's going gonna, it's gonna to improve your health care delivery enormously. When regular x-ray was only finding things 50-60% of the time, when 3D x-ray examination was employed, uh, abnormalities with root canal teeth were seen over 90% of the time. So, you know, when they just look up at an x-ray, well, I, not that you need to see pathology in a root canal treated tooth, for all the reasons that I've told you. But the point is, is if you do a really sophisticated imaging, you'll see the spaces, AKA abscesses, around the root canal treated teeth over 90% of the time with this type of imaging. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Rich Fisher, uh, some time back, uh, asked me along with Dr. Kulatz to put together an informed consent. Uh, uh, I don't know, I guess, it, whether or not it will be adopted, I don't know, but we submitted an informed consent for the IAOMT to use, suggest to use when offering a root canal treatment to a patient. And they say, oh my God, he's saying, offering a root canal? Everybody should have their options, okay? I'm not going to tell anybody you can't have this, you can't have this, you can't do that, you can't do that, but put the information out there, all right? And if some of you are wondering, well, I have patients with root canals already, and mm, they do have heart disease, and are they going to, I don't know, sue me or think I'm a horrible uh, dentist because I did this to them? There's two things you can do. One is is you can point them toward uh, the book that Dr. Kulatz and I wrote, People Need to Educate Themselves. I'm not in favor of telling anybody, do this. Or you can take this informed consent form, which is probably easier on the patient because all they have to do is digest a couple paragraphs. And they can see those couple paragraphs that, well, some people get root canals and do okay, other people get root canals and they don't do okay, what do you want to do? And one of the things that's just come out and has been supported in a couple other studies, if you have present in your mouth one or more root canals, we're not talking failed root canals, we're not talking quote unquote infected root canals, we're not talking about radiologically abnormal root canals, we're talking root canals, you have an increased chance of heart attack. That's in the dental literature now, 2009. Now, uh, traditional risk factors, we have inflammation, cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking. It's interesting because the inflammation, I told you, that comes from the vitamin C deficiency. Cholesterol, let's clarify one thing about cholesterol. Cholesterol does accelerate the growth of a plaque. It is not the primary cause of a plaque. Furthermore, cholesterol elevates in your body 
secondary to an increased toxin load. Cholesterol is a natural antitoxin and one of your body's natural defense mechanism against toxins. So if you have a cholesterol of 280, do you have an increased chance of heart attack? Yes, for two reasons. One is that so much cholesterol, it is going to deposit out of the blood easier. And number two, it means you have a circulating toxin load that's not being addressed. High blood pressure, as I said, is very important for seeding the pathogens. Diabetes. Remember the relationship, you know, when, when you talk about, well, there's an increased incidence of heart disease with diabetes. Okay, well, look at what they have in common. Dentists that I've known have told me this. I, I haven't examined enough, amount, enough mouths to know this, but say you never see lousier gums than you can imagine than in diabetics. Is that correct? What do, what do disease gums have in common with heart disease? Everything. Okay? I'm going to tell you the primary mechanism by which diabetes causes heart disease is because of the lousy gums and the chronic periodontal infection that is promoted. Now, they have a lot of other risk factors going on, and those will accelerate things too. But when the but when, the, when it comes down to crunch time, I think it's the periodontal pathogens that the condition of diabetes fosters and allows it to develop. Same thing with smoking, okay? I'll, I'll ask that question too. Uh, <laughs> anybody ever known any chronic smokers to have healthy gums? No, okay? So, does smoking do a lot of other bad things? Sure. I mean, it might cause lung cancer and get into your lungs, this, that, or the other, but I've always puzzled, how does it relate to heart disease? Okay, yeah, it's a toxin, but why is it heart disease and not something else? I would submit to you again, it's the fact that smoking induces chronic periodontal infection. Okay, so... As I say, bad luck or wrong dental procedure. It's still amazing to me. And if I'm sounding judgmental, well, maybe I want to be, I don't know. Uh, even now, cardiologists, internists, family practitioners, general practitioners, if someone's on their cholesterol med and their blood pressure is controlled, and they're 55 years old, they get a heart attack. They don't say these words to the patient, but they think, what can I say? The poor son of a gun had bad luck. Okay, not the case. So always check the oral status of a heart patient since it's not only the cause of heart attacks the vast majority of the time, it is also the most easily remedied of causes. And addressing this, because of what we just looked at with the other factors, eliminating toxicity, which raises your cholesterol, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it also simultaneously lowers and lessens the other established cardiac risk factors at the same time. So, uh, what have about five minutes? Or okay, oh. all right, okay. Uh, Now, just to give you a little bit more of a, my broadened base toward patient care, regardless of the chronic degenerative disease is, and even if you're not uh, practicing general medicine versus general dentistry, these are still things that all healthcare practitioners, I think, play an important role and at least pointing their patients in the right directions because your patients are always saying, well, 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 doctor, what should I do? Am I doing enough? Is there anything else I need to do? You know, you told me this, you told me that. Well, I'm going to tell you, I consider the four main things for reversing coronary disease and most chronic degenerative diseases, you lessen new toxin exposure, you eliminate old toxins, 
you restore hormonal balance and you optimize antioxidant levels throughout the body. Now, we, we went through new toxin exposure, okay, primarily the root canals and the gums and the tonsils. And other more ignored and less realized factors. One of the other books I wrote is entitled Death by Calcium. I can't summarize that book in 30 seconds. But I'll tell you, the title is no exaggeration. Okay? If you have any supplement with calcium in it, throw it away yesterday. Zero, 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 zero calcium supplementation. Everybody in this room has an excess of intracellular calcium in their body. And whatever chronic degenerative diseases you have, it is fueling them. And one of the primary reasons to get better and way to get better is to get that calcium out. So for God's sake, don't take more. So along with no calcium supplement, lots of magnesium, vitamin K2, omega-3, antioxidants, and for heart disease, lysine. Vitamin D3 regulates your calcium, regulates how much you need to take. You don't need to take any more than what's in a normal diet, and a normal diet does not include milk drinking. Milk should never be a beverage. Each glass is a calcium overdose. They actually make milk now where they add calcium to it. It's just unbelievable. No iron or copper. Zero. Unless you have an iron deficiency anemia, don't come close to taking any iron. Copper, you have more than enough. Don't take any copper. The amount of copper and iron, that you, especially copper, that you need to deal with and motivate <laughs> As a cofactor, the coenzymes and the enzymes in your body is infinitesimal, okay? Unless you have some exotic metabolic disease, you're never going to become deficient in copper. And if you don't have a documented iron deficiency anemia, you're never going to be low in iron. But calcium, iron, copper, they're the big three. They're what I call the master nutrient, master toxins. They are intimately and integrally involved in both normal and pathological apoptosis or programmed cell death. They trigger everything that you need to be triggered to kill a cell. They absolutely need to be maintained in the proper amounts. And if you start supplementing them like it's something good, you're just going to make whatever you're trying to treat worse. Eliminate stored toxins very quickly. Just remember detoxification is retoxification. When you get toxins out of the cells, they don't all get out. So you need to detoxify slowly, and you need to give a lot of antioxidant support while detoxification takes place so that the, te so that the toxins that don't go directly out the body don't get restored and poison new tissues in the process. Very wonderful way to detoxify slowly and steadily with very few problems is the far infrared sauna. The far infrared sauna sweats out everything. Everything. They say iron is trapped in your body. BS. You sweat out iron. You sweat out iron very effectively. Young athletes will routinely and there are studies on this, sweat themselves through a training season down to an iron deficiency anemia. Okay? Sweat takes care of iron. If you've got a lot of iron, though, give the blood. That's the way to get it out quick. <coughs> blood donation. <coughs> Restore hormonal balance. Just remember these things, and this applies to testosterone, it applies to estrogen. You want to make sure that anybody that has, any woman, any man that has measurably below normal levels 
of estrogen or testosterone to be appropriately supplemented to a mid-range or low normal status. Don't shoot for the high range, especially in an older person. It's like putting jet fuel in a Model T. Okay? But if you don't help it a little bit, low testosterone, low estrogen, they both increase all-cause mortality. Okay? Yes, you take too much of them, they could give you a heart attack too. That's, that's why we're clinicians. Okay, you got you to gotta go back and forth. You got to look at blood work. You got to make sure things get regulated at the right, at right level. Generally, low, slow, and if possible, bioidentical. Lower dosing for longer periods of time, and as I said, low to mid-range normal. Interestingly enough, something that will help you track over the long term how well your patients are doing is the coronary artery calcium score. That does not just reflect your chances of heart attack. It reflects your chance of death from all causes which also comes back to why calcium is so important. When you have too much calcium throughout your body, you have an increased chance of death from all causes. And because it's easily measurable, the coronary artery calcium score represents a wonderful way to measure what's going on throughout your body. Okay. Thyroid hormone. Very important topic. Only a few seconds. Low thyroid increases all-cause mortality. High thyroid increases all-cause mortality. It's still very difficult to figure out how to treat thyroid because the thyroid tests aren't that good. Uh, you need to find a clinician uh, that can give and willing to interact low doses and follow somebody more clinically than with the blood work. But probably a majority in my opinion, of adults in the United States have some degree of hypothyroidism. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we don't make enough thyroid hormone inside our cells. And you need to find factors that actually trigger the deiodinase enzymes that convert T4 to T3 inside the cell. Okay. Optimize antioxidant levels. Remember one, two, and three. Uh, are important. CRP is a very good test for looking for inflammation inside the body. Now, with regard, okay, finally, uh, this is something for more with people with a clinical practice, uh, but Vitamin C does a lot of good for a lot of things when you take enough of it in the many different forms it comes in. And I'm finding that people on this what I call multi-C protocol, you have liposome encapsulated, you have sodium ascorbate powder, one goes intracellular, one goes extracellular, ascorbyl palmitate goes fat soluble, and IV goes super high dose. All of these things together can often work clinically when they're not responding optimally to a large amount of just one form. So, recap. Heart arteries never become chronically inflamed and infected without a source of pathogens or toxins to seed and support this inflammation and make it and maintain it chronic. The chronic inflammation results in a chronic scurvy of the coronary arteries and initiates a chronic influx of inflammatory and immune cells that actually becomes the disease of atherosclerosis itself. The heart attack patient might be unlucky, but there's always something that can be done to turn that luck around, and it usually involves focusing on the mouth. Very importantly, both the dentist 
and the physician need to realize on a practical everyday basis that their fields of endeavor are inextricably intertwined and neither can no longer ignore the other. I think in a perfect world, the dentists and the physicians would both go to medical school and you all would become specialists in dental medicine. That's how I think it should be approached. Okay. So, that's about it. That's my website. That's my email address. And you can feel free to have a complimentary copy of the book. Thank you, Dr. Levy.